Well, I'd like to welcome everybody to my shop. I'm Bob Ackerman, and uh, we're getting ready to take some pictures of some horns, but this little introduction is just to tell you a little bit about the business that I've been running for over 35 years now, uh, where I've kind of uh, hunkered down on the best gear for saxophone players, clarinet players, and flute players. Uh, you know, I was originally, I had to handle the mouthpiece doctor, and uh, one of my favorite technicians uh, for mouthpieces has been Ted Klum. Uh, we've got some, some of Ted's nice pieces right here. Focus tone in brass, focus tone in sterling, and Ted's copy of a, of a Link Super Tone Master. Uh, his Acoustamax, his Acoustamax gold plated, his Acoustamax and his Acoustamur in alto. Uh, I find these pieces to be the very, very best ones that I could put my hands on for modern day saxophone playing on modern saxophones. Uh, I also like them somewhat on the uh, vintage horns. Uh, however, I do uh, play more vintage pieces most of the time on my 20s and 30s cons. Uh, Ted's got a very good technician working for him now, Sebastian Knox, and there's a lot of vintage pieces that either Ted or he has done. We've got things like old Goldbacks, Slant Line Auto Links, Master Model Auto Links, Super Tone Masters, Brill Heart Rubber, uh, another Brill Art Rubber. I also do a thing with clarinet and uh, I've had Brad Bain do some facings for me and I've had uh, Tim Wright do some facings for me and Sebastian kind of tweak them a little bit at the end. Here for example is a Casper, a Frank Casper from Chicago. It's a piece a lot of clarinet players jump through the ceiling for. This one, in all honesty, had a chip out of the tip and was restored, and it's a fantastic piece uh, going for $400. And uh, as you know, some of those pieces are on the moon price-wise. More uh, silver pieces, we've got things like Hollywood Dukovs. Uh, later I'm going to talk more about some of these things, but uh, the mouthpieces have to be a part of the equation is you can't really play these instruments completely without these mouthpieces. Uh, on, the, on the horn side, uh, I have had uh, the good fortune to hook up with Tenor Madness Randy Jones some 21 uh, years ago, and uh, until Randy got too busy to really be able to do anything for me, he fixed a lot of horns. As a matter of fact, here's one he did years ago and it just came back in Saturday. It's a 260,000 con tenor. We're going to talk about that later. Uh, I use Randy, one of Randy's assistants, for a great deal of my best horns, uh, Aaron Barnard. And uh, Randy, of course, makes the resonators now, the custom brass resonators that were originally made by Resotech. And uh, I use those or the sterling ones in the horns most of the time. But some horns I do uh, prefer nylon. Uh, a lot of work goes into the setup of a horn. I, uh, I'm, in, I'm at the final end of every horn. As a matter of fact, this horn today we've been working on uh, with the Gorilla Tape. Uh, where's my Gorilla Tape? Well, here's a small piece. I, I actually uh, do the setups to the key heights myself. Then I hand it over to my brother Russ, who's a very fine technician also, and he replaces the tape with cork. And so I get horns tuned, fine-tuned to my specifications. If you come see me, I help you with that. And many times guys have brought their horns in, I've tuned it up, and then they go to the shop and have it changed. Uh, I do lots of detailing with the necks. We have uh, 
there we have the information, we get the information off a of caliper and uh, I very often measure the opening at the tip and then we go on from there. For example, this one measures 450, 453. That's down in the Chewberry Alto Sax range. Uh, lately, I've been uh, working with replacing some of my Chewberry Alto necks with necks without the radial. You see, this one on the left has doesn't have the radial, and this one has the radial. Anyhow, I do a lot of work with the necks and uh, make sure that they're back to the original size. One of the things you have to realize, and it doesn't take 50 years for this to happen or 70 years, uh, necks get opened indiscriminately by repair people when they take a drumstick of some kind and put it on the tip so that they can when they're putting a new cork on they can uh, shave it down and uh, if they shove it on there even gently it can open the neck a little bit and if once it starts happening it can go on and on and on and eventually uh, you have a more open neck I have um, done a study of the horn. every time I get a new horn I measure the neck uh, for example this con tenor right here it's only 487 now I've seen many many cons like this where the neck was 505 510 and that just means that uh, somebody dropped the neck on the floor it got knocked out around the repairman said okay let's round it out he took his mandrill and he opened it and got it back to round but now it was five or ten thousandths more open that knocks your intonation and your tone out and that's Part of the reason a lot of people come up with this theory that, well, the old horns didn't have such a good intonation. Just listen to the recordings and you'll hear something different. And it's also the key heights. Today, guys are playing number seven, eight, nine, and ten size mouthpieces. This dictates having the action, the key heights raised way up. If you look at this horn, you can see this is set up for me now and you see it's quite far down that's where original cons were okay uh, well I hope you uh, have enjoyed this and that you'll come see me uh, if you want a real special kind of